Chapter 6 Europe in the Middle Ages by Ierna Lifford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 The Rise of the Franks. The historian Tacitus, whose description of the German tribes we have already quoted, had told the people of Gaul that, unless these same Germans were kept at bay by the Roman armies on the Rhine frontier, they would exchange the solitude of their woods and morasses for the wealth and fertility of Gaul. The fall of Rome, he added, would be fatal to the provinces, and you would be buried in the ruins of that mighty fabric. This prophetic warning proved only too true when Vandal and Visigoth, Burgundian, Hun, and Frank forced the passage of the Rhine and swept in irresistible masses across vineyards and cornfields setting fire to those towns and fortresses that dared to offer resistance. The Vandal migration was but a meteor flash on the road to Spain and North Africa, while on the battlefield of Chalon the Huns were beaten back and carried their campaign of bloodshed to Italy, but the other three tribes succeeded in establishing formidable kingdoms in Gaul during the 5th and 6th centuries. At the head of the Visigoths rode Athalf, brother-in-law of Alaric, unanimously chosen king by the tribe on the death of that mighty warrior. Instead of continuing the campaign in South Italy, Athalf had made peace with the Emperor Honorius and married his sister, thus gaining a semi-royal position in the eyes of Roman citizens. I once aspired, he said frankly, to obliterate the name of Rome and to erect on its ruins the dominion of the Goths, but I was gradually convinced that laws are essentially necessary to maintain and regulate a well-constituted state. From that moment, I proposed to myself a different object of glory and ambition, and it is now my sincere wish that the gratitude of future ages should acknowledge the merits of a stranger who employed the sword of the Goths not to subvert, but to restore and maintain the prosperity of the Roman Empire. Fortified by such sentiments and the benediction of the emperor, who was glad to free Italy from his brother-in-law's presence, Athalf succeeded, after a short struggle, in establishing a Visigothic kingdom in southern Gaul, stretching from the Mediterranean to the Bay of Biscay. This, under his successors, was enlarged until it embraced the whole of the province of Aquitania, with Toulouse as its capital, as well as both slopes of the Pyrenees. The Burgundians, another German tribe, had in the meanwhile built up a middle kingdom along the banks of the Rhone. Years of intercourse with the Romans had done much to civilize both their manners and thoughts, and they were quite prepared to respect the laws and customs that they found in Gaul, so long as they met with no serious opposition to their rule. The fact that both Burgundians and Visigoths were Arians raised, however, a fatal barrier between conquerors and conquered and did more than anything else to determine that ultimate dominion over the whole of Gaul should be the prize of neither of these races, but of a third Teutonic tribe, the Salian Franks, whom good fortune placed beyond the influence of heresy. The Franks were a tall, fair-haired, loose-limbed people, who, emerging from Germany, had settled for a time in the country we now call Belgium. Like their ancestors, they worshipped Woden and other heathen gods of the Teutons, while in their Salic law we see much to recall the German customs described by Tacitus five centuries before. The king was no longer elected by his people, for his office had become hereditary in the house of Merovius, one of the heroes of the race. No woman, even of the Merovingian line, might succeed to the throne, nor prince whose hair had been shorn, since, with the Franks, flowing locks were a sign of royalty. Yet, in spite of the king's new position, the old spirit of equality had not entirely disappeared. The assembly of freemen, still held once a year, had degenerated into a military review, but the warriors thus collected could demand that the coming campaign should meet with their approval. When a battle was over and victory obtained, the lion's share of the booty did not fall to the king, but the whole was divided by lot. A great part of the Salic law was really a tariff of violent acts, with a fine that those who had committed them must pay, 
so much for shooting a poisoned arrow even if it missed its mark so much for wounding another in the head or for cutting off his nose or his great toe or worst of all for damaging his second finger so that he could no longer draw the bowstring the underlying principle of this code was different from that of the roman law which set up a certain standard of right inflicting penalties on those who fell short of it thus the roman citizen who murdered or maimed his neighbor would be punished because he had dared to do what the state condemned as a crime the frank in a similar case would be fined by the judges of his tribe and the money paid as compensation to the person or the relations of the person whom he had wronged the idea being not to appease the anger of the state but to remove the resentment of the injured party for this purpose each frank had his vergeld literally his worth gold or the sum of money at which according to his rank his life was valued beginning with the nobles of the king's palace and descending in a scale to the lowest freemen when the franks left belgium and advanced conquering into northern gaul they also fixed vergels for their roman subjects but rated them at only half the value of their own race the vergeld of a frankish freeman was two hundred gold pieces of a roman only one hundred by the beginning of the sixth century when the franks were well established in gaul the management of their important tribal affairs had passed entirely into the hands of the nobles surrounding the king these bore such titles as major domus or mayor of the palace at first only a steward but later the chief minister of the crown the seneschal or head of the royal household the marshal or master of the stables the chamberlain or chief servant of the bedchamber the most famous of the merovingian kings as the descendant of merovius were called was clovis who established the frankish capital at paris he and his tribe though pagans were on friendly terms with the roman inhabitants of northern gaul and especially with some of the catholic clergy when clovis sacked the town of soissons he tried to save the church plate and especially a vase of great beauty that he knew saint remy bishop of rheims highly valued let it be put amongst my booty he said to his soldiers intending to give it to the bishop later but one of them answered him insolently only that is thine which falls to thy share by lot and with his axe he shivered the vase into a thousand pieces clovis concealed his fury at the moment but he did not forget and a year afterwards when he was reviewing his troops he noticed the same man who had opposed his will stepping forward he tore the fellow's weapons from his grasp and threw them on the ground saying no arms are worse cared for than thine the soldier stooped to pick them up and clovis raising his battle-axe high in the air brought it down on the bent head before him with a comment thus didst thou to the vase at soissons clovis married a christian princess clotilda a niece of the burgundian king and at her request he allowed their eldest child to be baptized but for a long time he refused to become a christian himself one day however when in the midst of a battle in which his warriors were so hard pressed that they had almost taken to flight he cried aloud jesus christ thou whom clotilda doth call the son of the living god i now devoutly beseech thy aid and i promise if thou dost give me victory over these my enemies that i will believe in thee and be baptized in thy name for i have called on my own gods and they have failed to help me shortly afterwards the tide of battle turned the franks rallied and clovis obtained a complete victory remembering his promise he went to rheims and there he and three thousand of his warriors were received into the catholic church bow thy head low said saint remy who baptized the king henceforth adore that which thou hast burned and burn that which thou didst formerly adore when he became a catholic clovis had no idea that he had altered the whole future of his race for to him it seemed merely that he had fulfilled the bargain he had made with the christian god he did not change his ways but pursued his ambitions as before now by treachery and now by force it was his determination to make himself supreme ruler over all the franks 
and in the case of another branch the ripuarians he began by secretly persuading the heir to their kingly title the young prince cloderic to kill his father and seize the royal coffers cloderic fired by the idea of becoming powerful did so and wrote exultingly to clovis my father is dead and his wealth is mine let some of thy men come hither and that of his treasure which pleaseth them i will send thee ambassadors from the salians duly arrived and cloderic led them secretly apart and showed them his money running his hand through the pieces of gold that lay on the surface of the coffer the men begged him to thrust his arm in deep that they might judge how great his wealth really was and as he bent to do so one of them struck him a mortal wound from behind then they fled thus by treachery died both father and son but Clovis unblushingly denied to the Ripuarian Franks that he had been in any way responsible. Cloderic murdered his father, and he hath been assassinated by I know not whom. I am no partner in such deeds, for it is against the law to take the life of relations. Nevertheless, since it has happened, I offer you this advice, that you should put yourselves under my protection." The Ripuarian Franks were without a leader, and like all barbarians they worshipped success so believing that clovis would surely lead them to victory they raised him on their shields and hailed him as king each day god struck down the enemies of clovis under his hand says bishop gregory of tours describing these events and enlarged his kingdom because he went with an upright heart before the lord and did the things that were pleasing in his sight it is startling to find a bishop pass such a verdict on a career of treachery and murder the more that gregory of tours was no cringing court flatterer but a priest with a high sense of duty who dared when he believed it right to oppose some of the later frankish kings even at the risk of his life yet it must be remembered that a sense of honor was not understood by the barbarians except in a very crude form they believed it was clever to outwit their neighbors while to murder them was so ordinary as to excite little or no comment save the infliction of a vergeld if the crime could be brought home centuries of the civilizing influence of christianity were needed before the men and women of these fierce tribes could accept the christian principles of truth justice and mercy in anything like their real spirit the romans and gaul had almost given up expecting anything but brutality from their invaders if they aroused their enmity and therefore welcomed even the smallest sign of grace thus the protection that clovis afforded to the catholic church after her years of persecution blinded their eyes to many of his vices when clovis had made himself master of the greater part of northern gaul he determined to strike a blow at the visigoths in the south it pains me he said to his followers to see arians in a part of gaul let us march against these heretics with god's aid and gain their country for ourselves probably he was sincere in his dislike of heresy but it was a politic attitude to adopt for it meant that wherever he and his warriors marched they would find help against the burgundians and visigoths amongst the orthodox roman population it seemed to the latter that clovis brought with him something of the glory of the vanished roman empire kept alive by the catholic church and now revived through her in this her latest champion in a fierce battle near poitiers clovis defeated the visigoths and drove them out of aquitaine leaving them merely narrow strips of territory along the mediterranean seaboard and on either slope of the pyrenees he also fought against the burgundians and though he was not so successful reduced them temporarily to submission when he died at the age of forty-five he was master of three-quarters of gaul and had stamped the name of his race forever on the land he had invaded his work of conquest was continued by his successors and reached its zenith in the time of king dagobert who lived at the beginning of the seventh century dagobert has been called the french solomon because like the jewish king he was world famed for his wisdom and riches not content with maintaining his power over gaul to the west of the rhine he fought against the saxon and friesen tribes in germany and forced them to pay tribute at last his empire stretched from the atlantic to the mountains of bohemia the duke of brittany who had hitherto remained independent of the franks 
came to offer his allegiance while the emperor of constantinople sought a frankish alliance a chronicler of the day speaking of dagobert says quote, he was a prince terrible in his wrath toward traitors and rebels he held the royal sceptre firmly in his grasp and like a lion he sprang upon those who would foment discord End quote. another account describes his journeys through his kingdom and how he administered justice with an even hand not altogether to the joy of tyrannical landowners his judgment struck terror into the hearts of the bishops and of the great men but it overwhelmed the poor with joy in the troublous years that were to come his reign stood out in people's minds as an age of prosperity but already before the death of the king this prosperity had begun to wane luxury sapped the vigor of a once powerful mind and body and the authority that the French Solomon relaxed in his later years through self-indulgence was never regained by his successors. With a contemptuous title, the sluggard kings, the last rulers of the Merovingian line, had passed down to posterity. Few were endowed with any ability or even ambition to govern. The majority died before they had reached manhood, looking already like senile old men, and the power that should have been theirs passed into the hands of the mayors of the palace who administered their domains on state occasions indeed they were still shown to their subjects as they jolted to the place of assembly in a rough cart drawn by oxen but the ceremony over they returned to their royal villas and in insignificance nothing was left to the king save the name of the king the flowing locks the long beard he sat on his throne and played at government gave audiences to envoys and dismissed them with the answers with which he had been schooled it was a situation that could only last so long as the name merovius retained its spell over the franks but the day came when the spell was broken and a race of stronger fibre the carolingians usurped the royal title the heads of this family had for generations held the office of mayor of the palace in the part of gaul between the meuse and the lower rhine then called austrasia it was their duty to administer the royal domains in this large district that is to see that the laws were obeyed to superintend the cultivation of the soil and to collect a share of the various harvests as a revenue for the king this was more important work than it may sound to modern ears for in the early middle ages the majority of people unlike men and women today lived in the country Ever since the decay of the Roman Empire, when the making of roads was neglected and then the imperial grain fleets disappeared from the Mediterranean, the problem of carrying merchandise and food from one part of Europe to another had grown steadily more acute. As commerce and industry languished, towns ceased to be centers of population and became merely strongholds where the neighborhood could find refuge when attacked by its enemies people preferred to spend their ordinary life in villages in the midst of fields where they could grow corn and barley or keep their own sheep and oxen if the crops failed or their beasts were smitten by disease a whole province might suffer starvation the mayor of the palace must guard the royal domains as far as possible from the ravages of weather wolves or lawless men for the king of the franks as much as any of his subjects depended on the harvests and herds for his prosperity rather than on commerce or manufactures by the end of the seventh century the mayors of austrasia had ceased to interest themselves merely in local affairs and had begun to extend their authority over the whole of france nominally they acted in the name of the merovingian kings but once when the throne fell vacant they did not trouble to fill it for two years the franks made no protest it was to their mayors not to their kings that they now turned whether in search of good government or daring national exploits the carolingian charles martel charles the hammer was a warrior calculated to arouse their profound admiration he was a herculean warrior says an old chronicle an ever victorious prince who triumphed gloriously over other princes and kings and peoples and barbarous nations insomuch that from the slavs to the frisians and even to the spaniards and saracens there were none who rose up against him that escaped from his hand without prostrating themselves in the dust before his empire 
it was charles martel who saved france from falling under the yoke of the saracens a race of arabian warriors who crossing from africa at the strait of gibraltar subdued in one short campaign three-quarters of spain describing the first great victory over the gothic king rodrigo at Wadalate, the governor of africa wrote to his master the caliph o commander of the faithful these are no common conquests they are like the meeting of the nations on the day of judgment puffed up with the glory they had gained the saracens who were followers of the prophet mohammed believed that they had only to advance for christian armies to run away and over the pyrenees they swept in large bands seizing first one stronghold on the mediterranean coast and then another before this invasion charles martel had been engaged in a quarrel with the duke of aquitaine but now they hastily made friends and on the field of poitiers joined their forces to stem the saracen tide so terrible was the battle we are told that over three hundred thousand saracens fell before the frankish warriors inflexible as a block of ice this number is almost certainly an exaggeration and so also is the claim that the victors by forcing the remnant of the mohammedan army to retreat towards the pyrenees in hasty flight saved europe for christianity even had the decision of the battle been reversed the moors would have found the task of holding spain in the years to come quite sufficient to absorb all their energies indeed their attacks on gaul were from the first more in the nature of gigantic raids than of invasions with a view to settlement though at the time their ferocity made them seem of worldwide importance thus it was only natural that the mayor of the palace to whom the victory was mainly due became the hero of christendom the pope who was at that time trying to defend rome from the king of the lombards set to implore his aid but charles knew that his forces had been weakened by their struggle with the saracens and dared not undertake so big a campaign some years later his son pepin the short seven fifty one seven sixty eight who had succeeded him received the suggestion with a different answer. Pepin, as his nickname shows, was short in stature, but he was powerfully built and so strong that with a single blow of his axe he once cut off the head of a lion. Energetic and shrewd, he saw a way of turning the Pope's need of support against the Lombards to his own advantage. He therefore sent Frankish ambassadors to Rome to inquire whether it was not shameful for a land to be governed by kings who had no authority. The Pope, who was anxious to please Pepin, replied discreetly, He who possesses the authority should doubtless possess the title also. This was exactly what the mayor of the palace had expected and wished, and the rest of the story may be told in the words of the old Frankish annals for the year 751. Quote, in this year pepin was named king of the franks with the sanction of the popes and in the city of soissons he was anointed with the holy oil and was raised to the throne after the custom of the franks but childeric who had the name of king was shorn of his locks and sent into a monastery the last of the merovingians had vanished into the oblivion of a cloister and pepin the carolingian was ruler of france with the Pope's blessing, he had achieved his ambition, and fortune soon enabled him to repay his debt, mainly, as it happened, at another's expense. In the last chapter, we described the effect of the Lombard invasion of Italy and how the Teutonic race sank its roots deep in the heart of the peninsula, leaving a Greek fringe along the coast that still considered itself part of the Eastern Empire. Rome, in theory, belonged to this fringe, but in reality the popes hated the imperial authority almost as much as the aggressions of Lombard king and dukes, and struggled to free themselves from its yoke. When Pepin, his own ambition satisfied, turned his attention to the pope's affairs, the Lombards had just succeeded on overrunning the exarchate of Ravenna, the seat of the imperial government in Italy. Collecting an army, the king of the Franks crossed the Alps without encountering any opposition, marched on pavia the lombard capital and struck such terror into his enemies that almost without fighting they agreed to the terms that he dictated legally he should have at once commanded the restoration of the exarchate to the empire 
but there was no particular reason why pepin should gratify constantinople while he had a very strong inclination to please rome he therefore told the lombards to give the exarchate to stephen too who was pope at that time and this they faithfully promised to do but as he turned homewards they began instead to oppress the country around rome preventing food from entering the city and pillaging churches pepin was very angry when he heard the news once more he descended on italy and this time the lombards were compelled to keep their word and the papacy received the first of its temporal possessions ratified by a formal treaty that declared the exact extent of the territory and the papal rights over it this was an important event in medieval history for it meant that henceforward the pope who claimed to be the spiritual head of christendom would also be an italian prince with recognized lands and revenues and therefore with private ambitions concerning these it would be his instinct to distrust any other ruler in the peninsula who might become powerful enough to deprive him of these lands while he would always be faced when in difficulties by the temptation to use his spiritual power to further purely worldly ends on the way in which popes dealt with this problem of their temporal and spiritual power much of the future history of europe was to depend pepin in spite of his shrewdness had no idea of the troubles he had sown by his donation well pleased with the generosity he had found so easy with the title of patrician bestowed on him by the pope and perhaps still more by the spoils that he and his franks had collected in lombardy he left italy and was soon engaged in other campaigns nearer home against the saracens and the rebellious german tribes in these he continued until his death in seven sixty eight end of chapter six